When you walk with the Lord, every step counts. Walk it out. A new sermon series. Somebody say, walk it out. Walk it out. They, they didn't believe you. Say it one more time. Walk it out. Walk it out. In 1998, 1998, a movie was released called The Truman Show. This movie was kind of peculiar because in this movie, Truman did not realize that every single step he took in his life, there was a camera watching him. In fact, he thought he was an ordinary person, living a regular life, living a somewhat, somewhat normal life. But his entire life, he was being followed by a camera. He thought he was normal. He had no idea he was actually a TV star. People would watch him at home and a camera would follow him every single place he went. In fact, when he was at home as a husband and a family man, the camera followed him. When he was with and interacting with his neighbors, the camera followed him. When he was in his front yard doing yard work, the camera followed him. His entire life, he was followed by a camera. And people didn't have to guess who he was or what kind of life he lived because his entire life was under a camera. And so they could evaluate and give a report on Truman's life because he was followed by a camera. What would your life look like? What report would it give? What would be the conclusion if a camera was to follow you for the next seven days. Not, no, not the TikTok video that you rehearsed <laughs> and decided to post. Your actual performance. Not, no, not, not, not the picture you posted on Instagram after you done took it seven times, found the perfect angle and filter. No. A picture of what your life actually looks like. What would we see if a camera followed you as you just raised your hands and worship God? Would the praise you have in here make it through the lobby, across the parking lot, into your car? Or when you get in your car and turn on your radio, would the praise be turned down and your life actually be turned up? What would we conclude if we followed you to brunch? Some of you would kindly order some orange juice And just a little bit. No, no, this, this one ain't for the homies. This one's for me. It's called, it's called a mimosa. What would they conclude after watching your life? What testimony? Not my life, not your neighbor's life. What does your life say if a camera was to follow you for the next seven days? And in our text, we're going to, to Revelation, opening up, oh Lord, help us. <laughs> I knew it was the end times, Lord help. Revelation chapter two. 
In our text, God has evaluated seven churches. He, he's not about to give a report on what the church submitted. He's not going to give a report based on what the church says or thinks they represent. God is going to give a report of what he has seen after evaluating these churches. And in chapter 2, verse 2, this is what God says to the church of Ephesus. He says, I know your good deeds, your good works, your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people. That you have tested those who claimed to be apostles, but are not, and have found them to be false. Verse 3 says this, you have persevered and endured hardship for my name. Don't miss that. And you have not grown weary. In our text, God has evaluated one of the churches at Ephesus. And God's report, watch this now, God gives them a praise followed with a reproach. But don't miss it. God, God gives them praise. I don't want you to miss that. When God evaluates this church, God says, listen, you've done hard work. You've worked really hard. He tells the church of Ephesus. Then he says, you know what? You've also persevered. You've persevered. Then he says, in fact, you know what? You have found the, the wolves in sheep clothing. You found them. In fact, Paul tells Timothy, be careful because there's going to come a time, and I think it's right now, where people are going to turn towards teachings that tickle their ears, but it's not the truth. I'm going to find this Sunday to preach that. We ain't going to do that today. Listen. But he says, you, you found those who were trying to tickle your ears, and you found out they were false prophets. I didn't mean to point at you, brother. I apologize. I didn't mean to point at you. Realist of the year. I didn't mean to call him that. That brother's light shining in here and out there. Amen? But listen, he said, you've persevered. Then he says this. He says, in fact, you've done some commendable things. You've gone through a rough time. Don't miss that. He said, you've endured hardship. He said, when life got hard, you didn't grow weary. When it got rough, you held on. When, 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 when opposition came up against you, you stood your ground. And when you went through a roller coaster called life, you stood your ground. He said, and I want to praise God for you because you endured hardship. Then he says this. He says, what, what, all that you've gone through, you didn't quit. You didn't grow weary. You, you know, th th there are some things in life that can cause you to lose your mind. There are some other things that can cause you to lose your faith and your trust in God. But he says to him, listen now, I want to make sure that you understand I've evaluated you and you've done well. I've evaluated you and you've done good. I've looked at your life and you've done some commendable things. And I believe that if God was to survey Faithful Central Bible Church, God would say, you've done good deeds. I believe God would say, you've been consistent. I, I believe God would say, you are an incredible mother. I heard one amen. I guess Mother's Day will figure out the rest of y'all didn't. <laughs> Lord have mercy. They did better at seven. They still got a hand clap. You've been, I believe if God surveyed the church, this church, he would see some amazing mothers. I, I believe if God surveyed the church, he said, You've been an incredible dad. That's, that's, I believe God would say that. 
I believe if God surveyed the church, he would say, you know what? You've been an amazing wife. Yes, you have. I believe if God continued serving, he'd say, you have been an incredible husband. I believe God would say that. I also believe God would say, you have been thriving in your singleness. Yes, I believe he would say that. He would say, you are, you are thriving all by yourself. You are thriving, and I'm working through you. You don't have to be married for God to use you. Let me just say that twice. You don't have to be married for God to use you. In fact, the Word of God says he can do more through you if you're single. Nobody preaches that. Well, all, all the single ladies and women, just give God praise right now for about two seconds because God's hand is still on you, his anointing is still on you, and he can still use you. Amen? And I believe, I believe God would say, you are an incredible businesswoman. Yes, you are. I, I believe God would say, brother, you are an incredible businessman. I believe if God, the camera kept going, God would say, Faithful Center sure has some phenomenal entrepreneurs in here, some gifted, talented people. I would say, I think he would say, you, you know how much, how much talent God has placed in here? The, 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 the gifts that God has played, I think he's like, you took a faithful central. There's some gifted, I'm looking at some really phenomenally gifted people in this church. I believe God would say that. I believe God would look and say, I see some faithful ministers in this house. I see, I see ministers who have, who have sacrificed their time, their talent, and their treasure, going through all kinds of storms, but they still held on. I believe that if God was here, he'd say, you know what? There's a reason why there's faith in Faithful Central. Because Faithful Central, through everything they've gone through, there are people who keep faith. I believe God would say that. Have, have you ever just looked at your life, seen how it's gone and realized, just like he said in the text, he says, listen, you've endured hardship. Has anybody besides me gone through some stuff, gone through some storms, gone through some heartache, gone through some loss, gone through some suffering? But listen, you didn't hold on to yourself. You held on to the one who's always holding on to you. I'm not here because I made it by myself. I'm here because God's keeping power. I can't keep myself. I'm here because I know the one who holds on to me. Can we praise God for about two seconds for his keeping power? It, it, I, I, when, I, when I look over my shoulder, I realize that when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I didn't make it by myself. God was with me. Anybody in here going through a hard time? But your testimony is God has keeping power. I could have quit a long time ago. I could have thrown in the towel, but God has keeping power. He's kept me. I believe God would say Faithful Central has some faithful people, some phenomenal leaders, some phenomenal people in Faithful Central Bible Church. And the more I kept reading the text and I realized God says, you've done, don't miss this. God has more good things to say about the church of Ephesus than he has negative things to say. In, in, in fact, God, God has a list of five or six or seven things that they've done very, very well, and he only has one thing against them. But I realized when I was reading the text, I said, you know what, I think, I think they were struggling with and suffering from tunnel vision. <laughs> the danger of tunnel vision, now, now tunnel vision Listen, there's, there's, there's pros and cons to it, but tunnel vision is when you, you, only, you remove everything out of the way so you can hone in on and focus on a particular goal or task. Don't miss this. Tunnel vision is when you have decided, listen, that you're going to move everything out of the way and you're going to hone in on or focus in on this one particular goal or task. Tunnel vision. You move everything out of the way, and you hone in on, you focus in on a particular goal, a particular plan, or a particular task. Are you still with me? Listen. And the danger, watch this, the, the, the danger of this is that you can be very successful. Say it one more time. And with tunnel vision, listen to me. There are pros to tunnel vision. Tunnel vision, you can become extremely successful. In fact, with tunnel vision, you can actually accomplish the goal. Yes, you can. You can accomplish the goal. Listen, if you move everything out of the way and you just focus on this, uh, you kind of should be successful at whatever it is you put all your attention into because all of your effort, all of your energy, all of who you have in you is going to be poured into this particular task. Are you with me? And you, you will probably be successful. You'll probably accomplish it. 
you will probably finish the project. Have, have any of you been on a job? And they said, I need this on Tuesday by 3.30. And everything else has to move out of the way because you still want your job. I plan to get paid on Friday. So this project will be turned in Wednesday at 3.30, Tuesday at 3.30. So you do every, it's tunnel vision. You, you, we have jobs. We have assignments on our life that put us on a clock. And, and the danger of it when you're trying to open a business or you, or you have a plan is that you can move everything. Look, you can hone in on this thing and be very successful. You can get awards. You can get accolades. You, you can get a direct deposit. Praise God. I got your attention now. Direct deposit. Lord help. Where's it coming? A check. Listen to me. You can be very, very successful with tunnel vision. Here's the flip side. By default, when you have honed in on this particular assignment or project or call on your life, by default, everything else by default has now been unimportant. Which means if it's not the particular thing that you're honing in on, it does not get your time. It does not get your attention. It does not get your affection. It does not get your love. It, it does not get you pouring into it because you have pushed everything aside so that you can focus in on this particular thing. And here's the problem. You can do this and be very successful. Here's the bad thing. Whatever isn't in front of you will probably fall apart. Y'all, they, they don't like me this morning. <laughs> They're finished with me, so I'm coming over here for a little while. And somebody raised the eyebrow, I was like, security. <laughs> security, just be, just be ready to start the car right now. But listen, the danger is you can be very successful. The problem is you may get a report like this. You've done hard work. You've persevered. You, you, you have tested Apostles and found out that they were fake. You have endured hardship. You, you, have, you have not grown weary. And I've seen people have tunnel vision and be very successful. And as a consequence, I've seen them lose their family. I've seen people pour everything they can into this particular area of their life and lose the relationship with their children. I've seen people pour everything they have into this particular assignment and they have no friendships. I've seen people pour everything they possibly can into this particular area of their life and everything else fails but they're a success. They have the award. They have the title behind their name. They have the recognition, but everything else they've lost. Is it really success? If you actually got what you wanted and lost everything else. He says, you've done good work. You've done good deeds. You, you have You've even defended me, and it cost you something. But then he says this in verse, in verse 4. Watch this. Verse 4, he says this. He said, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Y'all ain't praying with me. Listen, he gave a great report. Don't miss that. God, you did incredible. You did hard work. You, you worked hard. You persevered. You defended me. You, you, you found who, who the faith, false prophets were. You did it. You, listen, that's a commendable list. But he said, in the middle of all of those accomplishments, that's just one thing. God said, you forgot about me. I blessed you with the job. Now I have to look up. And I haven't seen you since. 
Lord, I just want a husband. You got him. And he, ha- I have to keep looking, and he hasn't seen you since. Lord, I just want a wife. And you got her. Who, he who finds a wife finds a good thing. You got your good thing. And he hasn't seen you since. Because the word of God also says, and obtains favor from the Lord. You took the favor. But you didn't take him with you. Listen, he says, listen, you, you've, you've shown that you'd rather have the presence instead of my presence. God, God says, listen to me, listen, you, you've done amazing things, but boy, I got one problem, one problem, one problem. When you cut the ribbon and opened the business, you went inside, and I was thrown away with the ribbon. I got one thing against you. You, you, prayed at, you prayed at the altar. And when you went on the honeymoon, I never saw you again. I got one, I got one thing against you. You walked across the stage and you, anything is possible. <laughs> Listen, before, before you took that last step off the edge, Jesus. And that's the last time you called his name. He said, I got one thing against you. You've forgotten your first love. I blessed you with the job. I gave you favor for success. And you, you decided, you decided, you decided, I got this one, God. Then he says this. He says, he says do me a favor. He says, I, I can help you with this. Do me a favor. God is gracious. He says, consider, watch this, consider how far you've fallen. Go back to the text. Verse 5 says this. He says, consider how far you've fallen. Then he says this. Repent and do the things you did at first. Then he said, if you don't repent. Hold on now, that's grace because he gave you an option. If you don't repent, I will come to you, and I'm explaining explain this in a minute, and remove the lampstand from its place. Let's see, the ministers got that one. Look, they know their Bible. They say, ooh. Whoever did that needs to see Sonia after service. You need to join the choir. I heard that. She hit the note. I am healed. You could have sung the song with him. I, I heard it. Listen. So, so, so listen. I want to give you three things. The first thing that he says, consider how far you've fallen, right? So if I, if, if I found out, listen now, that I've forsaken my first love, the, the, the love I have for God, what do I do? First thing I do, I must acknowledge. Somebody say acknowledge. The distance in my relationship with God. Now, now look, look, first of all, I'm not judging none of y'all because I had to deal with this myself all week. All right? The, the, the word hit me in the back of the head before I preached. Okay? So, so we're all included in this. But I can't examine you. I can't examine your walk. This, this is now personal. Now, you have to consider, is there any distance? There may not be. Praise God. Praise God for that. But, but you should consider. Watch this. The distance. Now, when he says Consider, consider means, listen, it means to recall information from memory. What does that mean? You can recall a time when you only wanted to be in my presence. He, he's not talking to somebody who doesn't know Jesus. He, he's saying, listen, there has become distance in the relationship with us. Listen now, and I need you to consider for memory what it used to look like when you actually displayed your love for me. Then he says this, he says, one one translation says fall, another other says forsaken. Listen, how, how, how much distance is between us or consider how much you have fallen or how much you have forsaken me. The word of God says, the God who says he'll never leave you nor forsake you allows you to have free will and you can choose to forsake him. I'll preach that another week. But listen, when he says forsake, listen, it means to abandon a relationship or to disassociate yourself from a present relationship. So, so in other words, he's saying, listen, look how much distance is between us because there was a time when you took me everywhere. (laughs) 
There was a time where you, would, you wouldn't dare go into the boardroom without praying on your knees because you know if you didn't go in that boardroom with the presence of God, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, you didn't know how that meeting was going to work out. So you would never go in a meeting without first, in fact, you wouldn't even make a decision in your life without first talking to God. Now you just talk to yourself. We got this. Pay attention. There was a time you wouldn't make decisions. You, you, you talk to your friend, cool. You talk to your parent, cool. You talk to your spouse, cool. But there was a time where the first person you would talk to is God. Because you knew there is no relationship greater than the relationship you have with God. Yet, I have this against you. You don't come to me first. In fact, you don't come to me at all. He says, listen, he says, but, but I can you, we can fix this. Consider how much distance has become between us. Watch this now. Then he says, repent. Stay with me. Repent means to turn or change direction. So, so if disobedience or, 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 or whatever, whatever is, if I'm walking down this road and this road is not the will of God, then it means I don't do a 360, the camera is cute, but you don't do a 360 because then you're going in the same direction. It, repent means to do a 180, which means if God's will is not this way, I must change my direction and I must go this way. Are you with me? Listen, pay attention. But you don't, you never change your direction until you first change your mind. My direction only changes when my mind has changed. So if I don't believe there's any distance between me and my relationship with God, I'll keep going in the boardroom without him. I'll keep going in my house without him because I don't believe that there's a problem. But if I consider that there's distance between me and God, I will then, next point, reprioritize my life in such a way that I make sure when I'm moving forward, I only want the presence of God. So I can only change my direction if I first change my mind. Are you with me? Consider how much distance is between you and God. Then because I have acknowledged that there's distance between me and God, now I must reprioritize my life in such a way that God is first. Are you with me? Okay, now you have a, a wife, praise God, but he's first. You have a husband, praise God, but God's first. You, 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 you are the head of your house. You're single and you're thriving. But God is first in that house. You have a business and it says CEO on it. Praise God. But God must be the CEO of your life. It, I'm, I'm reprioritizing my life now. Listen, because I realize that there is distance between me and God. Here's the last thing I have to do. I must make sure that I place God at the center of my life. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. I have to make sure that I place God at the very core. The, my love for God, my passion for God must be at the very center of everything that I do. And this is what God says. He says, or I will remove my lampstand. Yeah, the ministers know exactly where we're going. This is the book of Revelation. Now, in, in Revelation, there's a bunch of symbols, over 300 symbols and, and, and analogies. Now, it's very difficult to understand most of these, these, these symbols. But listen, there are clues. First thing is, John is writing the book of Revelation. If you read the gospel of John, John only uses, he always uses darkness and light to contrast one another. Are you with me? So the, and, he, and also, when, in Jesus' ministry, when Jesus goes into the temple, Jesus sees the lamp stands in the temple and says, listen, I know you see those lamp stands that are giving light, but I am the light of the world is what Jesus says. Then Jesus says, listen, you wouldn't put a bowl over your light, but you will put it on the lamp stand so that it gives light to everybody in the house. Which means, listen, that if he removes it, listen, the reason why I have the light is so that I can be a witness. 
So anytime I put a bow over the light, I'm not allowing the light of God to shine through me. Hence, I'm no longer a witness. Now, the book of Revelation reveals to us, listen, that God has placed us, you and I, to be prophetic witnesses, which means when somebody follows my life, they should see there is something different about the way that I live my life, no matter what office or what arena I'm in. Watch this now, because I'm not going to put a bow on it, but I'm going to put my light on a lamp stand so it gives light to everybody in the room. I don't know what your office looks like, but I, know, I don't know how dark it is, but when you walk in there, there should be some light in the dark arenas that God has placed you in. God didn't call you there to fit in and stand in line. God sent you in there to show up and show out with integrity, with love, and with power so that his light can shine through you because you might be the only Jesus somebody sees. If I followed you, for the next seven days, would your light lead me to Jesus? When I walk in your office and it's dark, I should see a corner that has light in it. And as dark as it is in the office, I, I should be guided to the light because God's placed his light in you. When, when, I, when, I, when I go to your, your real estate office, I, 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 there are people ha who have no integrity. There, there are people who will do whatever they can do to get an extra dollar and raise it a percent. But when I walk in your office, I believe that because the hand of God and the anointing of God is on you, I can walk in there and I can see light. When God places you, and he has, and he will, in leadership positions. I should experience something else about you as a leader by how you handle me, whether I do good or bad, because God's hand is on you and his light should be shining through you. But it only happens when Jesus is at the center of it all.